I think we hit peak inflation late last year. Okay. And now the question you have, if you want to use a ski analogy for all of us in the North, are we in a green run and blue run or a black run? Right. <laughs> Love oh, it. And I would argue right now we're in a green run. We're still trending down, you know, we're at the fence as core CPI expectation of three and a half percent by Christmas or next year or this, this Christmas looks possible. Maybe probable, maybe they're a little off. So that puts us on the green run, which is to say the bond yield curve is going to start getting steadier and steadier. Can I, can I suggest something? This is the anti-08, right? You think about 2008, where we were. So from 04 to 06, Al Greenspan raised interest rates, what, 350 basis points. And he put the subprime mortgages and the non-conforming mortgages into prices in 06, 07. Remember the, all that part. Um, and we had all the three-letter words that we shall not say anymore. And, <laughs> and the, the banking system got polluted by it. We had a banking person. No way. Hey, that's sort of a story. And think about the mortgages in 2008. Something like 40% of mortgages in the US, in US in 08 were, fixed, were floating, in which they, they reset their coupons. So as Sherrod Greenspan raised interest rates, costs went up for those clients. And we also had something like 25% of the market was non-conforming. So we weren't really sure they had enough equity and staying power. You know, under the guise of never let a good crisis go to waste, the US government did. In 08, they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. All of the mortgage market will be conforming. So now I think we're 90 something percent conforming mortgages, which is to say people who have the mortgage have demonstrated they have equity. So they have staying power. And the other thing is, I think, are we like 98% fixed rate today versus floating? So for a, a, an American with a mortgage today, they have not even felt reset risk. Okay. We haven't talked about a new buyer yet, but the, the average American who has a mortgage they don't reset their mortgage. In fact, if you have a 30-year mortgage, Manny or Freddie, at two and five eighths or 3%, you've just had an equity injection because you can, instead of paying off your mortgage, go buy a 10-year treasury and defease your mortgage. Right? This is the anti-08 if you're a residential mortgage holder. So, and that's the bulk of us in America. The bulk. Uh, especially the bulk of us over the age of 35. Right? Because getting a mortgage is hard to do. They know for a house is like super expensive. That's that 35 class group. And so we haven't had this sort of aha, aha crisis moment like we did in 08 because the mortgage market is incredibly healthy. The second thing, think about the banking system. The banking system now gets stress tests for events that were worse than 08. And the banking system's flying right through in the US. And partly they have more capital. They spent a decade doing nothing but build capital. We changed the rules on what counted as collateral capital. So, you know, the cardboard boxes no longer count as capital. <laughs> in the old days. Except in Europe. Except in Europe. Well, we could go. Because I do think that the, the worry for the world is rest of the world, not the U.S. this time. So if U.S. was the ground zero in 08, it's rest of the world now, not U.S. this time. And so if you put those together, so we have no. Um, so financial stability is very strong in U.S. The average homeowner is great. And then anybody who had, wants a job kind of has one. You haven't had stress yet. And so why is credit done wrong? Because really, we haven't any stress yet. You, you've had, and you know, maybe top line revenues fallen by selling for some, about 10%, but you haven't had that catastrophe moment like in 08. And I think that's a big, big deal. That might come a year from now or grind it, grind it out. But at this stage, it looks pretty good. And the last thing I'll say is, if you look at the high yield market, there's no evidence in the last decade that high yield companies added leverage. They didn't, you know, the bad behavior of the old LBOs, the MBOs, those things that would, you know, ratchet up debt levels, the companies, they didn't do that. The high yield market kind of has matured a little bit at the margins. And the high yield market mostly has turned out its debt maturity walls into 2026, 2027. So they have nothing to default to. So then for clients, it becomes a math question. If I can get 8.5% in you know, a high yield portfolio and defaults are going to be less than 5% next year, that's still a winning trade for me. And I think that's part and parcel where things are. It doesn't mean things are great everywhere and higher interest rates are hard on emerging markets in particular. And I think rest of the world where the mortgages, think of Canada, my, my hold, where they have reset, they, 
Canadians have trouble getting fixed rates for long periods of time, partly because if they have a fixed rate and they decide to move house, they owe the bank the difference in rates, right? So there's never, yeah. So, the, so a lot of people in Canada, but I would put England, Germany, uh, the Swedes, uh, the Netherlands, and the same camp have a lot of recent risk right now. And so if I'm worried about anywhere, it's not the U.S., and hence the U.S. dollar, it's the rest of the world. I also don't see excess. Well, there's a lot of leverage, but it's not. It doesn't feel like systematic, a systemic leverage, which is what you talked about. That doesn't feel. It's a. It, you know, at this kind of structure of economy, it feels that rates go up, the economy slows down, but you're not going to expose who's swimming naked. Sure, there's always going to be companies. There's always going to be some sector that runs into trouble, but it doesn't feel like it's systemic. And I, I think a lot of people have a recency bias. So they're like, see, it's going to be 2008 all over again. I'm like, feels to me like 1990, um, where we had a very common garden business cycle. There was a emerging markets got a bit clocked. The uh, housing market slowed down for a period of time. We lost a few jobs. But in the end, it was no big deal. Well, I would say commercial real estate got hit in the 1990s. I yeah. mean, Toronto, the way they lived in New York, the Reichman Brothers, things like that. Yeah, the um, same in London, Canary Wharf, the Reichman Brothers. Canary Wharf. Yeah. So I do think there will be things that go bump in the night. I, that, that doesn't, it's, but you're right, is it systemic yet? And again, I think part of the reason it's not is because 08 is so close that the obvious holes were fixed. And we haven't had enough time to get away from it to do bad things again. Talking of 08, there was a, the Basel III agreements changed how the banks dealt with risk and bonds on their balance sheet. And we've seen a market that is very illiquid. We, you know, can use the, you know, that, um, I think it's the Treasury Liquidity Index for bonds or whatever. It's just, it shows a very illiquid bond market. And we've got the massive hoarding in the reverse repo. And Janet Yellen started talking about this that maybe we need to release this because it's not good to have limited liquidity in the bond market. What do you think about that? And do you think there's a chance she does? Because if I think it does, then bond yields change lower much faster because Jamie Dimon and others can put a lot more of their balance sheet back into the bond market. Or is that not the case? How do you think about that? Mm. So when I think of liquidity in the bond market, um, at this stage, you know, the, the bond market volatility has gone up. So look at the move index. So if you think about the, the equivalent of the VIX, which is the S&P 500s, uh, is the move index, MLBE, and you clients can go online and look at it. The move index is definitely popped over the last 12 months and has stayed relatively high. I, and I, my personal view is I best in decay now because we priced in a lot of different things, including the bulk of the Fed heights. The hard part is when the Fed's moving so aggressive, whether it's 04 to 06 or today, uh, when they're moving so aggressively, or 1994, which your ring spend it the first time, uh, it's hard to say is something liquid or is it just because prices have moved so fast, buyers and sellers can't agree. The seller wants to buy it, you know, or sell it in yesterday's price. The buyer wants then wants tomorrow's price. So it spreads open. open wider. And I think that's what happened in the treasury market uh, and in other markets as well in the last 12 months. And I think it's still persists now in the stock market where you can just imagine people saying, I think this company's worth more. And the buyers going, I think it's worth less. PE should be lower. I'm not going to get into that. It's not my place. I'm on your bond side. You never want to take any guidance from a bond investor of stocks. They're really <laughs> dumb up here. <laughs> but um, when we think of it um, as, as investors in Merrimack, we, we think you know that liquidity is something that the Fed thinks about all the time in contact with markets. I think it's still pretty decent, other than vol is higher and will stay probably a little higher. Now, I'll give you one more thing. I think the Fed has learned a lesson with QE. I think if you go back to 2008 and we had Chair Bernanke, we were not even clear what were the rules of the road for the Federal Reserve. Could they do some of the things that we learned later done, right? So remember how long it took to get packaged together in 08, we, we didn't get it really done until it was President Obama's administration, right? He hadn't been formally sworn in, but he was the, the new president. 
And and the reason I say that is we weren't sure the rules of the road. Then we did a lot of things. QE, the Fed, you know, had a lot of power given to it. And I think we've used QE a lot in the last decade. You know, it's like you have an entity some power and they get to like it. And the first thing they did is they suppress a vol. And I think at first it was, okay, we could handle suppression of vol. We can do this. And they did it. And then 2020 comes along. We said, had the perfect example of suppression of vol. You know, we all go home with COVID. We're all trying to find toilet paper and we're scared. And the Fed cuts to zero. It does QE. Canadians do their version as well. The, the, the British, um, the, the Bay of England, I mean. And, and the reason I say this is it was all designed as suppressible. And it was a continuation of what we learned post away. On the other side of this, the inflation we've got today, I think the Fed, one of the lessons for the Fed is, aha, we can't suppress ball too much. We have to have people, winners and losers in this, so that they allocate capital properly, whatever that means, right? And so the reason I'm saying this is, I think that the Fed is happy to have a little higher volatility. So, if, if, and people call that illiquidity, kind of maybe, but it's definitely risk. And I think the Fed's comfortable there. No, they don't want unlimited risk. But that Fed put that was at the money is now way out of the money because they think they see the flip side of it. And this gets me back to why I'm more comfortable with 2% inflation long term. They can do it. And I think what we have to do is recognize that part of what you have to do to allow for 2% is things get a little messier in econ. And I think that's where we are. So I'm still pretty comfortable with liquidity overall in the treasury market. You can do whatever size you pretty much need to get done. It's still working very well. Um, the on the run, off the run treasury numbers are too bad right now in, in terms of basis points. So it's not horrible, like at all. And and I think it's kind of something we should get used to. And if you, if you ask me, it's uh, back to the 1990s fall. We're just taking out a lot of the suppression we did the heavy hand expression, and we're just going back to more 1990s, where you can still make a lot of money in markets. There's still a lot of upside for risk assets. It's just, it just you're going to have a little more daily vol to handle. And so a treasury market right now, the treasury market volatility daily is six to eight basis points a day, which is to say when it happens, there's no information in there. It's just bouncing. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.